From the mists of time, Singapore, a small island surrounded by islets, has had a singular passion for trade. Today, its Manhattan skyline is a dazzling advertisement for a high-tech economy, with banks and hotels that rival the biggest and the tallest in the world. The island symbol, the Merlion, gave Singapore its name, Lion City. Today, it proclaims the island's preeminence among the developing economies of Southeast Asia, with a standard of living second only to Japan's. The first settlers here, Chinese traders in pirate junks and Tamil seamen from India, came through the waters of Singapore in search of rice and spices. They left their mark. The Chinese, 76% of the population, call themselves Singaporeans, but their culture dies hard. Indians and Malays make up the other elements in this sometimes feuding cosmopolitan mix. The Queen knew from previous visits here that the influence of the British has been profound. Stamford Raffles, an East India Company official, landed here in 1819 to establish the British presence. Today, cricket still played on the village green. The clock still stands at 10 to 3. And is there honey still for tea? It was no surprise that the Queen was given an entirely British welcome. A less formal welcome awaited the Queen at the Townsville Primary School. The lion, that recurring symbol in Singapore life, began the first of many traditional dance displays the Queen was to see. This one performed somewhat self-consciously by the ten-year-old pupils of the school's dance club. symbols announced Her Majesty's arrival and heralded a dance rooted in Chinese folklore and based on the story of Madame Snake. Nineteen hundred pupils, many who'd never heard of the Queen before this visit, gave her a welcome equal to any she's received. On a visit to the Angmokia shopping centre, the Queen's party was overwhelmed by the crowds pressing forward to see her and by photographers. When she emerged from the crowd, the Queen appeared completely unconcerned. It's difficult to imagine any other leading head of state being allowed so close to uncontrolled crowds on a foreign tour. The Queen was then driven to Chinatown, The continued existence of this area is controversial. 
Singapore's obsession with the images of modern success once led the government to think of tearing it down. But parts of Chinatown survive in uneasy juxtaposition to the embrace of the newer Singapore. This combination of old and new, the mix of East and West, is one of the fascinations of this society. At the British Council, the Queen watched a demonstration of the 1986 Doomsday Project. Using a computer, an inquirer gets an insight into places where ordinary Britons of the 80s live and work. With the Queen's visit, the computer sought a reference to Balmoral. You see, at the last sentence it was, I am fortunate to live on Balmoral Estate because my parents work at the house. Oh, right, yes. And that makes the point. Do you know who that would be? The computer also calls up maps and pictures of places. Did the Queen wish to try? Um, Where is that near? Yeah. Elgin. 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 Right. So, so, so that's a place. Or, uh, Elgin's a place. Uh, how do you spell it? E L G I N. Yeah. And we should be able to find a photograph of this as well, or somewhere in the region. Yeah. I can recognize it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very successful. At the United World College, the Duke of Edinburgh spoke about the importance of the world's wildlife and about striking a balance between preserving wildlife and current environmental concerns like the ozone layer. Well, that's quite separate from all of you, and all, not only you, but an awful lot of people who are worrying about the ozone layer and the CO2 layer and global warming and, and God knows all these ghastly things that are happening all right. Those are going to affect us. There's no question about that. But somehow or other, somebody's got to look after the, the rest of the life on this planet, which after all, is, we are part of the life on this planet. We cannot exist without the rest of it. We have three cheers for the Duke of Edinburgh. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Thank you. <laughs> I was dreading you'd say that. What about a half holiday to mark the occasion? He said. <laughs> Pipers announced Her Majesty's arrival for a state banquet at the Presidential Palace, the Astana. Lee Kuan Yew on the Queen's right has been Prime Minister since 1965. He's seen by some of his countrymen as a vindictive autocrat who hates criticism and who stifles freedom of speech. But the Queen praised what he's done for Singapore. He has, over many years, proved to be one of the Commonwealth's sturdiest sheet anchors prudent in counsel and wise in judgment. Without you, Prime Minister, Singapore would undoubtedly be a very different place today. You can be justifiably proud as you lead your country into its silver jubilee year. The Queen's visit to the Cranji War Cemetery recalled as no other event Britain's role in Singapore's history. Topped by the Cross of Sacrifice, it's a memorial to the men who died when the Japanese invaded the then British colony of Singapore. Churchill called it the worst disaster, the largest capitulation in British history. For the people of Singapore, it's a bitter memory, the pain of which remains as sharp as ever after more than 40 years. The cemetery sits on a bluff which overlooks the straits where the Japanese landed in February 1942. The invasion took its toll. The occupation was much worse. Many of those remembered here died in the unspeakable horrors of the construction of the rail link between Thailand and Burma. Of one party of 7,000 sent from Singapore to Thailand in April 1943, 25% were dead by that August of starvation, heat, disease, and share brutality.
Queen came here to honor the doomed youth of a generation and to remember the 24,000 people who died in three terrible years. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. On the final evening in Singapore, Britannia docked in Singapore Harbour was the setting for a banquet given by the Queen. Her Majesty was repaying the hospitality she'd been given by President Wee and his wife at the Presidential Palace. After dinner, the Queen led the President and her guests, government ministers, politicians, and other prominent people in Singapore life, out of the state dining room, along the corridors, and onto the deck of Britannia for beating the retreat the Queen's farewell to Singapore and the start of a gentle two-day cruise up the Malacca Straits. By early dawn, two days later, Britannia and her escort were hugging the Malaysian coast, preparing to dock at Port Klang. By 10 that morning, a clamor of Malay drums greeted the royal visitors as they stepped off Britannia. Malaysia is a federation of 13 states, and Her Majesty's host here was the Crown Prince of Selangor. It's part of the traditional welcome here to throw rice, to invoke the spirits of prosperity and joy. In Malaysia, the Queen stayed at the Carcosa, a building with a chequered history. It was a British house, then Malaysian, given back to the British on Malaysia's independence before being reclaimed by the present Malaysian government. Destined soon to be an expensive guest house, its luxuriant gardens have a commanding view of the capital, Kuala Lumpur. The city's architectural mix is a near perfect sketch of Malaysia's history, dominated by Arabs, Indians and Chinese before its European phase. The central market reflects a thriving sector of the economy where enterprise is as keen now as it was when the Indians and the Malays fought the Chinese and the Portuguese for the spice trade monopoly. The Queen's formal welcome to Malaysia took place in Parliament Square. Malaysia has a rotating monarchy. Every five years, one of the country's nine sultans is elected king to reign under yellow umbrellas. They also use to honor visiting royalty.
the lavish courts of the sultans and the kings became justly known for their etiquette. Before state dinner given by the present Malaysian king, there was an elaborate exchange of gifts. Of the many, a gold-topped walking stick for the duke, and a carriage clock from the queen, suitably engraved, to Malaysia's queen. The sultans of Malaysia acquired their status and power in the 15th century. That began to diminish in the next 300 years. But as the state dinner for the queen showed, these courts have retained a great deal of the essence of their elegance, glitter and style. If Malaysia has one single sound, it is the Muslim call to prayer. From the time it was brought here by Muslim traders 500 years ago, Islam has permeated Malaysian life. The Abdul Aziz Shah Mosque is a fitting symbol to the religion's prominence. It's the largest in Southeast Asia. It's made some concessions to modern comfort, but the invitation to Her Majesty specified that she'll not be allowed to set foot on the carpet in the main prayer hall. No woman's allowed to do that. The queen had to wear a cloak specially made for her for the occasion. With the Duke of Edinburgh, she was shown round by the architect. Local photographers then scrambled over the queen's red carpet and an undignified scrum developed as security appeared to break down. The queen made her exit from the mosque through an unplanned route. Order restored, the Queen returned the cloak, but kept the slippers. The Duke of Edinburgh stood in for the Queen on a visit to the Selangor Cheshire home, part of a foundation of which Her Majesty is patron. The Queen was unwell. The Duke made her apologies. Well, the Queen apologises for not being able to come. But, uh, shall I, shall I, uh, I'll take it back and give it to her. <laughs> if the residents were disappointed in not seeing the Queen, they didn't let it show. By mid-afternoon, the Queen felt well enough to carry out her next engagement at the Selangor Turf Club. She'd come to present the Commonwealth Cup for a race to be run over a mile. There aren't a great many opportunities for off-course betting in this country, so in their thousands, punters come to the track and crowd the betting booths under the stands. The Queen spent some time looking at the horses in the paddock and much longer trying to read the form and make some assessment of the state of the going. At one point she moved over to the Duke of Edinburgh to give him the benefit of what she'd worked out. The Duke was non-committal, leaving the Queen slightly perplexed that he'd not taken her advice. But the Queen Elizabeth II once only handicap race was run and the £60,000 prize was won. A quick and slightly disorganised rearrangement of the red carpet had to be carried out before the presentation was made to the winning jockey. Next morning, Britannia sailed into the home port of the Malaysian Navy, Lamut, bringing the Queen on a short visit to the state of Perak and to the town of Ipoh.
It's difficult to know what the Queen made of this rather gentle dance routine. But she certainly seemed to enjoy the more robust Silat, the Malay martial art equivalent of Chinese Kung Fu. By the time the Queen's motorcade roared to its next stop, the weather had changed in this season of monsoons and the children waiting at Ipoh Airport were caught in a thunderous downpour. But it didn't last and by the time the royal party arrived, the sun had broken through the clouds again. At the end of her state visit, the Queen reboarded Britannia to meet individually and at dinner the 49 Commonwealth heads of government meeting here in Malaysia. She greeted the outgoing Secretary General Sonny Ramphail, and the Queen was delighted to welcome Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and Pakistan's return to the Commonwealth. The Queen reminded her guests that when they last met for dinner on Britannia in Nassau four years ago, they'd lost their way at sea and were late. Unlike the last occasion on which we gathered for dinner in Britannia, I'm delighted to see you all here on time and in good order. <laughs> it is essentially a family gathering. Like all the best families, we have our share of eccentricities, of impetuous and wayward youngsters, <laughs> and of family disagreements. But we also have our wise uncles and aunts, and the solid, dependable family members on whom everyone relies. This is the Queen's 21st visit to Commonwealth conferences, and to mark it, there was a cake. It, it's too much like hard work to blow <laughs> The Queen had begun her visit to Southeast Asia with persistent echoes of Britain's colonial past. It ended with an extraordinary image of the new Commonwealth Partnership. <laughs>